the Bible, 66 books written by 40 divinely inspired authors who tell one continuous story of God and His people. During the time of the kingdoms, through the exile, until the end of the Old Testament, God sent preachers called prophets to give messages to His people. Some of these prophets appear in books we've already covered, like 1 Kings or Ezra. The rest of the prophets appear in the books that bear their names. In fact, the final 17 books in the Old Testament are considered the books of the prophets, and their order isn't necessarily chronological. The first five are called the major prophets, and the next 12 are considered the minor prophets. This major and minor designation simply refers to the length of the books each prophet wrote. The longer books were placed first, and the shorter books second. Among the major prophets we find Isaiah, who lived in the southern kingdom of Judah before and during its destruction. Isaiah wrote to give the people hope, telling them that God would send a savior to redeem them. The book of Isaiah contains several very specific prophecies about Jesus, hundreds of years before his birth. In the Minor Prophets, we find the book of Jonah, which scholars believe was the first book of the prophets to be written. You may be familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale, and you'll find it in this book. All of these prophets wrote to warn the people of God that their disobedience would have consequences, but also to share hope that God would not abandon them, but would send someone to redeem them. The Old Testament ends with this mysterious phrase in the last book of Malachi. God says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. And just like that, the Old Testament comes to a close. It's confusing, it's cryptic, and disturbing and it's not really the way you want to end a book un unless you're planning to write a sequel. All right, good morning community. Morning. And we also say welcome uh, to our digital audience that are joining us and uh, like Sherry said, Merry Christmas. I'll tell you what, let's, let's do it. It's December, right? Why don't you just turn, turn a couple, find a couple people and just say Merry Christmas, all right? We got to get practice in this, right? Merry Christmas. Go ahead and do that right now. There you go. Merry Christmas. Absolutely. You know, I, and when I, th when I think about Christmas, because I always, I kinda, you can't help but think about kids, right? And uh, how many of you, you got a kid in your life? I mean, maybe it's your own kid. Uh, maybe it's a neighbor kid. Maybe it's a niece or nephew. Maybe it's a grandkid. How many, how many of you got kids? In your, I think we're going to get a pretty, okay. Every, we all got, we got kids in our life, right? Kids in our life, and I mean, kids, I mean, they are, they are so cute, right? Where's the picture? Here we go. Come on, help me out. There we go. Are, are kids cute? They're cute, right? So cute. But also so dangerous. <laughs> Those miniature people, they are dangerous because they are great at ruining stuff. <laughs> Let me give you some real life examples of stuff ruined by kids, all right? For example, how about uh, this one right here? Family room and couch? Ruined by kids. Uh, Ford minivan? <laughs> Only funny if it's not your minivan, right? <clears throat> Ruined by kids. Um, how about Christmas card pictures? We've all been there. <laughs> right? Come on, just smile, 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 right? Ruined by kids. Or how about uh, the pet cat? <laughs> I think I'm okay with that one. My, my, so when my kids were little, Sue used to always say that she says, you know what, I think God made them cute so we don't kill them. <laughs> that was what she'd say. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold on to like children and have kids ruining stuff, okay? I want you to hold on to that idea because here's the deal. <clears throat> we are God's children. We're God's children and he adores us. He loves us. But he also knows that we ruin stuff. We ruin stuff in our own lives. Sometimes we ruin stuff in other people's lives. Sometimes we contribute to ruining things even in the world, right? And I want you to kind of keep that in mind because as, we as we're moving through and we're turning the page, we're in, the, we're in week seven of our turn the page uh, journey through the Bible, and we're coming to a section today actually called the prophets, okay? And the prophets are, this is a really important uh, uh, section of the Old Testament. Now, the prophets are people like named Jeremiah and Obadiah and, and Nahum and Zephaniah and, Ma and Micah. And maybe at that point you're going like, hold on, 
I am familiar, I've heard some of those names, but I don't, I don't know anything about them. Well, here's a little secret. Most people don't know much about the prophets. Here's why. Because this, this, this is the least read, least understood, <clears throat> and also the least taught part of the Bible. And here's a little dirty secret. Most pastors kind of avoid the prophets. You know why they avoid the prophets? Because <laughs> they're hard to read, they're hard to understand, and they're hard to teach. So if you're kind of going like, I don't really get this, I mean, you're, you're actually in very, very good, good, good company. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to try to kind of give you some really simple things. Let's just start with what does it mean to be a prophet? What does it mean to be a prophet? A prophet is simply this. A prophet is a representative of God. Someone who acts as a representative of God. And the prophet would actually come, and usually to a particular group of people at a particular point in history, and he would, he would remind them, you are not <clears throat> being or behaving in a way that's consistent with who God created you to be. And they would tell him. And I was thinking about this. Now, maybe in a way that kind of will help it stick. I'm going to give you three phrases, okay? Three phrases, and this is kind of the simple message that almost all the prophets would deliver. And here it is, in these three phases. First of all, God made it. <laughs> you ruined it, but God will restore it. All right? Just so that kind of sticks a little bit, let's, let's, let's say that after me, okay? God made it. All right? You ruined it. God will restore it. Thank you very much. Very good. All right. Some enthusiasm. I like it. Now, here's what, here's what the prophets would do. The prophets would come and they'd remind people, in the very beginning, God created everything. He created our world and everyone that lives in it, and he made it perfectly. The world worked perfectly way back in the very beginning. <clears throat> it worked perfectly relationally. It worked perfectly uh, as far as the ecology. Everything about the world worked perfectly just the way God made it. And in fact, at the very end of all of creation, God looks and goes like, wow, even for me, that is very good. God made it. But the prophets, okay, weren't afraid to remind people, look them in the eye and say, guess what? You ruined it. You ruined it. Because prophets know, they knew that people have a tendency to blame others and sometimes blame God. Like, like they might, so, and often you'll hear questions like, well, how, how, could, how could a good God, and it's a great question, how could a good God let people live in poverty? How could a good God let, let people go hungry? Now, if a prophet heard that, okay, if a prophet heard that question, you know what a prophet would say? A prophet would say, hey, guess what? You know what? God made the world perfectly. He made the world in such a way that there's a, an abundance of food enough for everybody. He made the world in such a way that nobody should have to do without but guess what? Then he'd point at the people and say, but you guys ruined it. <laughs> Some of you are keeping it to yourself. Some of you are hoarding and being selfish. That's why others are doing without. So they, they, they were not afraid of shooting straight. They did not hold back. And so they would remind people of their disobedience. They would remind people of their sin. They would remind people of God's coming judgment. And they would say, just forthright, hey, God made it. You ruined it. But they wouldn't leave them there. A good prophet wouldn't leave them there because a the prophet that would add a third part, they wouldn't leave without any hope. They would say this. They'd encourage people. But listen, God will restore it. God will restore it. One day, this world will, will be restored way exactly back to the way God made it and the way he dreamed it would always be. All right? So again, I want this to stick in your head and also stick in your heart. So help me out, okay? Here we go. Say it after me. God made it. God you, made it. Ruined it. you ruined it. God will restore it. Keep those three things in mind, okay? You'll understand the mindset and the message of, of the prophet. So I'll tell you what, let's take one specific example. Let's look at the prophet Isaiah. Now, the prophet Isaiah, if we particularly look at a section in Isaiah 61, the scene from this passage was the reign of King Saul. We've kind of covered some of this territory the last several weeks. The reign of King David, and then the reign of King Solomon. They've all come and gone now, and now we're in a, in a, in a season, an era <clears throat> where the, the kingdom of Israel is actually split in two, represented by this blue and by the gold here. The northern was the tribe of Israel, and the southern was the tribe of Judah. Now, Isaiah actually lived in the tribe of Judah. And he watched them, he was able to observe them ruining what God had made. He saw them deliberately disobeying God. He saw them actually turning and trusting other gods. And in some cases, actually trusting kings, okay, men, more than they did their God. 
And so he would warn them. He, he would warn them, okay, like a good prophet would. He said, listen, God made you to be a blessing. He's blessed you so you could bless other people. You could bless the entire world. But you're not living out who God made you to be. Instead, what you're doing, you're ruining it. You're ruining it by rebelling and refusing to follow God's commands. And, and as a sidebar, all of us should know this. This is just true in the Old Testament, it's also true today. Anytime that we choose to live our lives in a way that's contrary to God's design and God's intention and who God made us to be, we're gonna ruin stuff along the way. Make sense? We're gonna ruin stuff along the way, anytime we do that. And some of us, we know, yeah, you're going, oh, I know all too, fo- I all, know all too well, I know all too well. And so now the people of, the people of Judah, they're, they're having to, to watch their world fall apart. They're being driven from their homes. Their beloved city of Jerusalem is being destroyed. Those who survive are being carried off into exile into Babylon. <laughs> and what does Isaiah say? He says, God made it, you ruined it. He gives them kind of the brutal facts. That's what prophets do. Here's the brutal facts. But he doesn't leave them without hope. Because now as we turn the page and get into Isaiah 61, he says these powerful words. Here's what he says. He says this to them. He says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. And that's from which I'm speaking. The Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind with the brokenhearted. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives and release darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Here's what God can and he will eventually do. He'll rebuild the ancient ruins. He'll restore the places long devastated. This is the prophet speaking to them. Remember this. He he will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Okay, what's what's Isaiah saying there? Help me out. Close. (laughs) Right? And then there's the third thing. He's gonna restore it, right, that's what he's saying there. So he said, God made it, you ruined it, now he's saying, guess what, God will restore it. That's the third thing, he's saying God will restore it. There's still hope. Now here's why this is so important, not just to understand back then, but also understand for today, because that was important for their day, but it's also important for our day, because the prophet Isaiah, like many of the other prophets, was yes, speaking to a particular group of people back then, but he's also giving hope for generations, including us, even today. Because these words are pointing to a coming savior, okay? A coming savior who would bring hope and restoration to all things and all people. So here's what I want you to do. So there we landed in the Old Testament, Isaiah 61. Now we fast forward several hundred years. Now we're in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus now walks into a synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. One of the attendants there hands him a scroll because he's supposed to read in front of the religious leaders there. He opens up the scroll. He turns to a particular section. I believe he picked this out on purpose. And he starts reading these words. This is not Isaiah. Now this is now Jesus reading in front of the synagogue in his own hometown. And he reads these words in Luke 4. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. All right, pop quiz. Nothing sends, you know, terror through a crowd like the, like the phrase pop quiz. <laughs> so pop quiz there. Okay, do you recognize these words? Yes. Okay, where are those words from? Isaiah. Isaiah 61, right? Did you notice that? Exact same words. So he's actually repeating, intentionally reading the exact same words out of those scrolls there in Luke 4, but now look what he says after this. Look what happens after this. If we continue to read the next couple of verses, it says, then Jesus rolled up the scroll He gave it back to the attendant, and Jesus sat down. The eyes of everybody in the synagogue, like in the church building there, are fastened on him. They're all looking at Jesus. And then Jesus began to speak, and here's what he said. Today, this scripture, spoken by Isaiah, is being fulfilled in your hearing. What Jesus was saying in that moment, he was saying this, I am here today to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah had, not only in Isaiah 61 said someone who was coming who would restore, renew, and rebuild, but also several other places he prophesied about this coming one. For example, in Isaiah 7, 14, look at this. 
You can go ahead and just read those. Isaiah 7, 14. He talks about someone's coming who will be born of a virgin. Someone's coming who will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus is now saying, I'm here. In Isaiah 35, 5, in the Old Testament, Isaiah says, someone's coming, he's going to do miracles. The, 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 the blind are going to be able to see. The deaf are going to be able to hear. And now here Jesus in Luke 4 saying, yes, I'm here. We go back to Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah eleven ten. the prophet says, one who's coming, who's going to draw people from every nation to himself. And Jesus is saying, yes, I am here. The prophet Isaiah was saying, one was coming who would renew, rebuild, and restore everything that was ruined. And here we see in Luke 4 that Jesus is saying this. He's saying, listen, today, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm here to restore everything that's ruined. So what I want us to do, I want us to move now from the Old Testament past the New Testament, Luke 4, to 2018. Because if that's true back then and it's true then and it's really true for today, let's look at our ruined world. There's so, many good, so much good in the world, but, but take a look at the things that are ruined and being ruined. There's, we could categorize if we wanted to. We could talk about, we talk about relational ruins. If I ask for a show of hands of people in this room who have been impacted, gone through broken families, broken homes, almost every hand in this room would raise. If I asked for people who even showing up today who would say, you know what, the truth is about my own marriage, the truth is about my own family, that it feels cold and distant rather than a place like God intended of warmth and grace, who is that? Again, a whole slew of hands would go up. Because what we do, we live, we live because we're inclined to do this, to ruin things relationally. We live in, we live in a place of physical ruins, you could say. I mean, just one sliver of it, we're gonna talk about how addictions are epidemic. I can say personally that I never, ever want to have to do another funeral for a young person who died of an opioid-related um, uh, addiction. Never. But here's what it's going to take, okay? And I, here, there's two things on this. Jesus is, Jesus is here today because he sees what's going on. In the, in the last year, the number of opioid-related deaths in DuPage County has almost doubled compared to what it was three years ago. And every headline reminds us that we live in a, we live in a place that's in ruins. And he wants, he wants to restore that. He wants to fix that. And he also wants to, he wants to work through his people, his church, to restore and fix that. You could talk about emotional ruins. Now, now some of this is, is, is on us. Some of it is done to us. We're talking about the anxiety, the tension. We now live in a, a, a time that they're calling the age of rage. And, 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 and some of this is, is, is something that we're experiencing and we, and we don't fully understand, but one in every five adults now has, struggles with symptoms of mental illness. And he wants to restore that, what's, what's broken there. Talk about financial ruins. I was, I was surprised, I, did, I was surprised, to, I guess I would have been a little bit naive about this. Did you know the average American will die with $62,000 of debt? If, and if they die with that, think about what they lived with. There's a financial ruins. There's spiritual ruins. The, 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 the greater total number and percentage of people in the United States who will not be in church, who will not be in church this weekend is greater than it's ever been in our lifetime. And that, that just includes our neighbors, our friends, our family, our coworkers, who live essentially in lives that you could categorize as kind of spiritual ruins. And so here, so that's, that's, that's I'm kind of being prophetic, right? I'm kind of being prophetic. <laughs> Someone going, definitely, man, you're bringing me down, Dave, <laughs> right? But, it's here, but if, if Isaiah was here, here's what he'd say. He'd say, hey, God made it. We kind of screwed it up. You ruined it. Now here's the good news, okay? The good news is this. In the middle of this broken and ruined world, on that very first Christmas, Jesus came and he said, I have come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it wasn't just true then, but it's also true in 2018, that everything that God made, everything, and maybe some of this is very personal for you, that's ruined, he wants to restore. Some of you came in today, and I had a, a conversation after the first social we're here, with a young lady who told me, says, yeah, I came in here and I was, get, I'm, 
I was making the phone call, and I was gonna sign the papers, I was getting a divorce. But, but as a result of what I heard God telling me today, I'm gonna hang in there, and I'm gonna give God a chance to restore this thing. And some of you need to do the same thing. For some of us too, it's, it's a physical thing. And please pay attention to the Holy Spirit's kind of prompt you. you. You really almost, it almost feels like your body's betrayed you. And it's a physical thing. And what you need is you, you need to have some people praying for you that believe in healing to ask God to restore that. Or, or maybe, it, maybe it's not even a, 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 the physical thing, maybe it's an emotional thing. For the worry and stress and anxiety of life, I mean, you are not the person you're supposed to be. And you need some people to pray for your emotional healing. Or maybe it is, maybe it's about your financial recovery. Or maybe it's spiritually, you got these longings for, for love and a longing for, for purpose and a longing to make sense out of the big questions of life. And, and only God is gonna satisfy those longings. Anything, I'm telling you, hear me on this, okay? Anything in your life, and this is what I hope really connects with your head and heart, anything in your life that you're going like, you know what, it feels ruined. This is not how God meant for it to be. It's not how he made it to be. Jesus wants to come and he wants to bring restoration to it. So, so maybe you're saying, okay, I got it, got it, Dave. How does this, how, what does this look like in real life? How does this actually work, right? How does this actually work? If there's ruined stuff that he wants to restore. First of all, I'd say this, it, it happens supernaturally. Okay, so you gotta be ready for, for you not to be able to explain it. Just God did it, he gets all the glory. It often happens through his church, and I think he often uses people like us. Let me give you a quick story. Um, the other day, I, uh, I, I was here at the Yellow Box, and I only had a few minutes for lunch, and I decided to run over uh, on 75th Street to Buffalo Wild Wings, right? Which is not a great choice, so I don't recommend that. <laughs> but that's, that has nothing to do with the story. <laughs> um, and so I, I sat down, and the server stops by my table, she takes my drink order, and, and she says, hey, aren't you Dave Ferguson? And I said, yeah, I am. And then a big smile comes across her face. She said, we go to the same church. <laughs> and I was like, that's cool. And, then, and she says, she says, and I absolutely love it. It, it has changed my life for the better. And then she leans me and says, you got, you got a second for a story? I was like, sure. And um, I saw her name tag. It said Aaron. And Aaron was about 25 or so. And she starts telling me stories. She said, I grew up occasionally going to church, uh, the church my parents went to. But it was, it was really more of a kind of a traditional church. It wasn't a bad church. It's just that it didn't really connect with me. And so I quit going sometime, you know, in high school. And, and uh, as a young adult, I just kind of found myself drifting. And he said, now in the last few years that I, I started drinking. I started drinking a lot. I started drinking too much. In fact, drinking so much that I felt my life kind of slipping out of control. And she didn't use this language, but I think what we're talking about today, she, she, she could sense that she was ruining, right? Ruining this good thing that God had made. She said, so I got an invitation uh, from a friend to start coming to community, and I came to community, I just loved it. I loved every part of it. I loved, every, I loved coming every week, and, uh, but at some point every week, I would, I would sit out there where, where you all are sitting, and I would pray. I, I would pray, I'd say, God, you gotta help me get control of this drinking. And I would ask, God, you gotta, you gotta help me somehow get control of this. And she told me this, she said, and one Sunday while I was praying, I just heard this inner voice say to me, you need to go find Dave. And she said, it sounds strange, but just as clear as I'm talking to you, I just heard this kind of this voice say, you need to go find Dave. And she said, now, I know you're the lead pastor, but I don't really know you, so I was pretty sure it wasn't you. <laughs> Which I was kind of like, well, that sucks, because that would have been a much better story for me. You know? <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't say that, I just kept listening. And, she's, and, and so she said, like, so all she heard was, you gotta go find Dave. She said, so I didn't know exactly what to do. She said, but church ended that Sunday and uh, I went and found my friend Leanna. She was on the prayer team. And I just asked Leanna if she would pray for me. And I told her, I said, I, I really, I feel like I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of losing control of this thing and I need to stop drinking. And Leanna prayed for her. And after Leanna prayed for her, Leanna said to her, she said, hey, I want you to meet somebody. And I, Aaron spoke up. She said, hey, who? And Leanna said, I want you to meet Dave. 
Dave's the guy who runs our 12-step uh, group here. And Aaron said, in that moment, I knew God was doing something big. I met Dave, I got in his 12-step group, and I've been sober every day since. And I just wanna tell you this, okay? I don't, know what, I don't know what's broken or ruined in your life, but I'm telling you, the same Jesus, the same Jesus that was prophesied by Isaiah, the same Jesus who came uh, to restore all things that first century, is the same Jesus, and he is here today, right here at this yellow box, and he wants to restore whatever's ruined in your life. And it might be relationships, it might be something physical or emotional, or maybe it's something financially which to get you out from under, or, or, or maybe it's something just specifically spiritual. Now here's the thing too, and you gotta turn the corner on this. Not only, here's, here's the cool part, this is exciting, not only does God wanna do this in you, okay? Restore, ruin things, but he also wants to do it through you. He wants to use you then, like he used Dave with Aaron, he wants to use you to help restore other broken things. In John chapter 20, verse 21, look at this, on the screen it says there, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Now. He wants, to, he wants us to be involved in the restoration of ruined things. One thing very, very, very specific, very tangible, this, 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 this time of year. How many, how many of you are familiar with our Christmas gift mart, our Christmas gift mart? Yeah? Okay, most of us here. It is an awesome, awesome thing that we've been doing for, I think, the last, oh man, I don't know, more than a decade, okay? In one very practical way, there's a whole bunch of kids for them because of circumstances outside themselves or maybe other people's choices, their Christmas is gonna be ruined. And we have an opportunity in a very specific way bring restoration. And here's kind of a, a video to tell you a little about that's how we do that. Hi, my name is Maria. This is my husband, Joey, and we've been coming to community for the last three years. At Beaupre Elementary, I am the parent liaison and I am the communication between staff and families. I'm the principal secretary at Bopri. We don't have an AP because we are a small school. I get to do everything, but I love it. It's all worth it. I love the community, I love the kids. So Gift Mart is where we have the families from our school along with a few other schools. They are able to get a ticket. They come in, they make a line super early. We welcome them in and they're able to buy different gifts. These are families that come from a low-income community, so for them it's amazing that they can come and buy. They get six gifts each, and they can purchase it for $2 each, but that money goes back to the schools that we are part of for our students. All the community locations, they gather all these different toys, and I know, I believe it's a value up to like $20, and it's not just, you know, the old toy that has been sitting in the basement or attic forever is actually brand new toy. So when these kids see these, they, they get ecstatic, you know, they get super crazy hyper about it. For the parents, I think the fact that they can bring a beautiful gift to their kids, you know, it means so much to them because this is the only way that they can do that. It's the only way that they can um, provide this for their kids. Sometimes they come with, you know, tears in their face just to say, thank you so much for donating that for me so I could put something under the tree. It's really not a part of a job. We volunteer to do it because we love it. And to see our families and our kids so happy, and some of the parents come with the oldest kids and they help to pick the gift for their youngest one and they get to wrap it for them. So it's just a beautiful experience. And you feel, you feel the love that day from everyone that goes there and volunteer and the families are just so happy and so grateful. And they, every year, you leave the end of the day super tired, but your heart is full of love and it's so lifting and it's so all worth it. I'll tell you, I, I love, love, love uh, our Christmas gift mart. And I'll tell you, today was the very first day of our toy collection. And so for those of you who brought toys, Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for being a part of that. You know how many toys we're gonna collect this year? Over 11,000, 11,000 toys, that's right. That's awesome, that is awesome stuff. 
And here's the thing, we will actually, uh, we'll have a toy collection again next Sunday. And again, um, candidly, if you're going like, oh, I didn't do it this week, I don't know when I'm gonna get it in, we're gonna make this as easy as we possibly can. As easy as we possibly can. You got two options. If you have our community app, go to our community app. On the home page. it says Christmas Gift Mart. If you click on that button, it'll take you right to Amazon, and there's a whole list of stuff that you need to order today in order to get it here so we can participate, uh, so we can be a part of the Gift Mart by next week. Or if you don't have our app yet, which you should have our app, but if you don't, you, you can text Gift Mart, okay? Listen to Gift Mart to 313131, and we'll send you a link that'll take you right to the Amazon Gift Wish Registry. Does that make sense? And this is, this is like one of those ways where Jesus is saying, hey, I want to restore all the ruined stuff in your life, but guess what? That's in you, but I also want to do it through you. Through you. Let me wrap this up. One of my favorite verses, okay, the favorite phrase, I think, in Luke 4, 19, that Jesus says, he says this, I have come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor. And I was just thinking about that this Sunday, and I guess that's what I want. I want to proclaim God's favor over every one of you. That he wants good things for you. He wants his favor, his grace for you. <clears throat> he wants to restore whatever you've showed up in this room that's ruined. If it's your marriage that feels like it's not what it should be, if your family is not what it should be, I want to just say, God's favor over you. You know what? Come and be a part of what we're doing. We'll support you. We'll encourage you. Come and join. Be a part of our Together Conference that's coming up. Because your marriage, your family, I'm telling you, I saw it first service, it can be restored. If you're hurting physically, you're hurting emotionally, I want to proclaim God's favor over you. <clears throat> we have a prayer team up here. And these are people of faith who they believe that God heals. Just the faith, just the faith of a mustard seed. Come over here. Come on up here and let, let them pray for you. Maybe some of you, you're, you show up today and you're, you're lost and just feel like things are lacking or you're feeling lonely. Stick around and go to our after party. Be a part of what we're doing here at Community. Let us journey with you. Let us guide you. Let us be generous toward you. God's favor over you. That's what we're doing. That's what we're about. Now, as we enter into this communion time, something that occurred to me, both from Isaiah and also from Luke, is that for there to be a restoration, Right? of ruined things, for there to be a restoration, there also has to be an impartation. For there to be a restoration of ruined things, there has to be an impartation of God's Spirit. Look at this in Isaiah 61. Before Isaiah proclaims hope of restoration, he says this, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Same thing if we look in Luke. Before Jesus announces how, the, how, how he's going to restore all things, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. And all of us come today. All of us do, including me, with ruined parts, parts that aren't as good as they once were, parts that are not good and never were, and they're ruined, and what we need is restoration. And this restoration, okay, this restoration, what proceeds is always this impartation. So in a moment, the ushers are gonna come and they're gonna offer you a piece of bread. Take that piece of bread, it's right under the body of Christ. Hold on to it and you say, you know what? God, I ask that your spirit come inside me and restore what's broken. Then you take that piece of bread, hold on to it too. And you can pray this prayer, say, God, you know, your spirit come inside me and inside my life. And you begin to put back together the broken, ruined pieces. We're gonna sing a song. It's a great song as we get ready to take communion together. So hold on to the bread and the cup. We're gonna take it together. And as we sing this song, it's a, it's a song called, that's titled, Do It Again. It's about God's faithfulness. How he has consistently in the past and in so many of our lives restored, ruined things. He can do it again. So let's invite God's spirit to come inside as we uh, receive communion. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you. We wanna thank you that you did. You're a good God who made all things and you made them perfectly. And we confess, we confess to our inclination to kind of wanting what we want and wanting things that you don't want and doing what we want and doing things that you don't want and it ruins our lives. It sometimes ruins other lives and even impacts the way the world's shape. But Lord, that's why we're here. Because as your kids, as your children, we want you to, we want to ask that you take these ruined things and you restore it and you make them whole. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.